Fantastic. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Summer 4. We are the Iranian American Bar Association, Northern California chapter. We're a nonprofit, all volunteer organization. My name is Ali Asare. I'm on the board of IABA NorCal and one of your co hosts today. And I am Kimia Tabrizi, also on the board of IABA NorCal and your other co host. And I'm Yaldania, also on the board of IABA NorCal, and your final co-host for today. Summer 4 is the fourth installment of the Summer 6 program. Very quickly, I, I doubt anyone's new to the Summer 6 concept, but it's a series of six programs we put together this summer to have incredible guests with us share their aha moments, their life knowledge, their epiphanies that change their careers, their personal and professional lives. Uh, so it's a forum to hear from them so we can all continue growing and moving forward this summer uh, despite all the challenges that everyone is facing. The theme of today's program is growth. Uh, we will have a cute little story about how this theme came about, but it's about the idea that everything is learnable, learnable and nothing is natural or immediately available to us. So thank you for joining today's program, Summer 4. Let's introduce our awesome guest. We have with us today, Janet Herman Stone. Janet, can you kindly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and what you do? Sure, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Janet Herman. I'm the Director of Attorney Development and Women's Initiatives at Morrison & Forrester, which is a global law firm. Uh, some of you might have heard of it. I started off as an associate in the corporate group, became enough counsel, and then after a number of years, switched into the non-lawyer role of attorney development, and then started also veering into the diversity and inclusion space a number of years ago. That's, that's my focus. We also have with us Nikki Khoshsamir. Nikki, would you please kindly introduce yourself and give us a little background about yourself and your company practice pro? Of course. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikki Khoy Samir, and um, I am the CEO and founder of Practice Pro. We are a legal education social enterprise. We mostly do like through different programs, training and coaching programs. We try to help law students, young lawyers get the jobs they want. And then also more importantly, the skills and savvy to climb up the ladder. Uh, we have customized training for firms and companies and law schools. We'll also do 
have, well, we usually have in-person law student conferences, but now virtual, and we'll also do some career coaching. I'm also the founder of IABA NorCal, so it really warms my heart to see the new generation of leadership. And even though you guys can't hear it, everybody's giving you guys an applause for your leadership this summer. Thank you. And finally, we have with us Scott Vinos. Scott, can you kindly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and what you do? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I want to express my appreciation for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I'm in Oregon, actually, um, which is a state to the north of California. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, uh, I serve as the Assistant Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at Oregon State University. And specifically, I work in an office called uh, the Office of Institutional Diversity. Um, I went to law school. Uh, Janet and I are both UC Davis uh, law graduates. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, I worked at uh, Shepherd Mullen in San Francisco for several years before making a transition into uh, higher education. Um, my role is uh, my role at Oregon State is really focused on organizational change um, and creating organizational equity. Um, I work with colleges and departments as they think through how to strategically make their um, organizations more fair for more people to serve more Oregonians, um, and that is um, work that I think. I wasn't expecting to find a line so uh, perfectly with my legal training, but in fact, I use my legal training every day. Um, and uh, maybe one other fun fact is that I also get to teach, a, teach classes. Um, and so I, I teach a course every fall on um, using science fiction as a lens to look at issues of social justice. Uh, and so um, uh, I'm always happy to share my syllabus because I think it's a fun one. <laughs> Um, but I'm really happy to be here and, and to speak with all of you. That's incredible. Thank you all again for joining us today, for all of the time that you've put in uh, to prepare for today, to do the rehearsal. So we really appreciate it. Let's get started. There's a lot to talk about. As always, the program will have three parts. We'll do an interview round. Uh, we'll do Q&A. Um, and all the, everyone who's listening, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time. If any question pops up in your mind, either put in the Q&A or in the chat box. We, we keep reading them as the program goes on. And we'll close out with a takeaway summary as we do every time, uh, four or five big takeaways from today so that you have some actionable things to take away from today. But before we start, as we also always do, uh, we wanted to use the Summer Six as an opportunity to help our amazing local artist community. And I had the pleasure of meeting today's musician for the first time as part of the Summer Six program, Saud Arikat. He's with us today. If you Google him, he is a local legend in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and he's super charismatic. He has amazing life stories that he'll also share with us today. So before we get started, Saud, why don't you set the mood for us with one of your beautiful songs, and we all get in the mood and get, go kicking after. Right on. Thank you so much, Ali. Here we go, man. When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes. Something without warning, love There's heavy on my mind Then I look at you And the world's all right with me Yeah, I just want to get you And I know it's gonna be A lovely ahead of me seems impossible to face oh and someone else instead of me always seems to know the 
Saud. Oh my Thanks, God. Ali. Appreciate it, man. In, in true uh, Iranian American Bar Association slash Middle Eastern fashion, uh, I'm getting reports that a lot of moms and dads of uh, attendees have been dancing in the background while, during your performance, Saud. <laughs> so really awesome. appreciate That's it. That's great to hear, brother. <laughs> uh, wonderful, uh, beautiful. Let's get started on uh, that positive mood. Uh, we had a poll up when, when Saud was playing asking the attendees how confident they felt about growing in leadership, networking, um, development, professional and personal during these COVID times. And uh, I think the majority says somewhat confident. Some people were very confident and some people needed help. So I think uh, that's a good sign. Folks are figuring, starting to figure it out. So Janet, let's jump in. Uh, the brainchild of this particular summer four theme was you. Um, I came just randomly to one of your workshops three, four years ago that really changed my life. I'd always grown up in a, in a typical Middle Eastern family with a very strong dad. And he always told me, Ali, you're so shy. You're not going to advance if you're this shy. And so I grew up thinking that I'm just naturally not a good leader. Um, some people are naturally good leaders. I'm book smart. So I'm going to study. They can be leaders and we'll just live that way. And I came to a workshop you taught on leadership that shattered that conception because you approached it scientifically. So there must be people listening that think they're not good at something. Can you tell us, using leadership as an example, just shatter that misconception the same way you did it for me? Well, first of all, I just love that story. So I could hear it all the time. It's so gratifying to know that I made a difference in somebody's life. Um, so... There's a book that I would recommend to everybody called Strength Finders, if you haven't heard of it before. And it describes that a strength is a combination of a talent and a skill. So there are some talents that you are born with. So for example, you might have perfect pitch, but the skill part is something that you can learn. And so if you take your natural talents and your skills and a mindset that says, I can always be better at those skills, you can develop a strength. So leadership, I definitely think is one of those things that is very skill-based. I don't, I think there are people who are born with maybe extroversion and they're really good at 
moving around a room and connecting with people. Maybe that's their natural talent, but there's a skill associated with learning how to be a leader. And overall, I would say leadership is really about moving people. That's what a leader is. So a manager to me is about getting stuff done. It's the stuff. But the leader is about, the secret to leadership is figuring out how to get people to do something that you want them to do because they want to do it. And there are skills associated with that that you can learn. Is that enough for you, Ali? You want me to, I could go on for a long time. So just cut me off whenever. Uh, we, we will circle back. That's a fantastic start. Uh, thank you for the book recommendation. Nikki, what, what is, um, reacting to what Janet said, what is your, when did you figure out your secret sauce and how did that happen? And you're on mute. We'll take you off. Oh, there we go. Um, so when I first read your question, when you first asked me that question, the litigator in me wanted to, when you said, when did you realize you're a leader? I wanted to say objection foundation that we haven't established yet that I'm a leader. But uh, um, when, as Janet was speaking, I realized, I think it's, I can give you an example of um, what my talent was. My talent was exactly what Janet said, where I was a connector and a people person. My mom will probably tell you she knew I was a leader when she came home um, one day and I was in fifth grade in Iran and she saw that the entire garage of there were like six families living in those condos with like 12 kids I had lined up all the kids we had decorated the entire garage we're like we're having an event and she's like what is going on here but that's probably when she realized it but for me regardless of what was happening on the outside in the starting IABA and when people were telling me that I realized that um, I was managing projects and you know, to me it's like being leadership is about solving problems. So there's a problem, something needs, you need to rise to that challenge and I was always there. But for me, I never felt like a leader. Like until I was able to gain some skills like Janet was talking about. And one was managing my internal storm and my emotions and getting that EQ so I could, you know, not just rise to the challenge, but not be like that sailboat in the wind that is constantly going this way and that way. And the second skill was for me, um, when I realized that, you know, to be a good leader also means to be, have, to have the capability to follow and let other people lead at times. And inspiring my team, inspiring my students, to be able to valuing their roles and having them be able to lead projects. And um, so I had to gain a lot of skills, like Janet said, to be able to complement what I naturally had to then be able to uh, feel like a leader with regardless of what other people were thinking about me. That's wonderful. And in fact, Janet also taught another workshop for our students last year on listening. <laughs> and I'd never thought about listening as a skill, but Janet went through it and really broke that down of how like there's deep listening where you actually listen to what the other person is saying and it gives you so much more information. Um, so great point, Nikki John. Thank you. Um, Scott, you work with a ton of students who are future leaders. And so I wanted to ask um, both the question I asked everyone else, when, when did you realize these inner strengths and how? And also now that you work with a lot of talent, talented students, um, are there themes you're picking up? Are there things people do that, that shows their, their leaders or how do you harness that? Um, yeah, I, I'll take the first question, which is I'm, I'll echo Icky, Icky which is like I, <laughs> I frequently, um, I don't, it's hard to see yourself as a leader. Um, and I think um, you don't realize it until someone tells you, thank you for your leadership. Um, and so one thing I would say is if you're, if you're observing really strong leadership to make sure to thank someone, <laughs> um, because I think it can help, help those folks sort of see themselves in those positions. And that's actually something that I do with when I'm working with students to, um, 
to make sure that they're recognizing these moments where they have had an, an, an opportunity to step in um, that maybe felt uncomfortable or felt risky um, that they're they're now finding themselves in a leadership you know in a leadership position. Um, one of the things that I talk a lot about with my students um, is to is to deliberate our values. Um, we don't spend sometimes enough time actually sitting down and thinking about what is what are the things that I value. Um, but I think it's one of the most important things that we can do as emerging leaders and as leaders. Um, and the reason for that is that every decision that we make, whether in a leadership position or not, is really rooted in a value, is, is um, rooted in our beliefs of what's important. Um, how am I going to act in this particular situation? Um, what does it mean to be ethical? Um, and so forth. And so for us to actually think about what what kind of individual values we hold, what are the organizational values, values we hold. And I actually find that it makes my leadership decisions a lot more easily easy um, if I have a good sense of who I am. Um, and so that's, I would say that's my, that's the message that I tend to give to students um, is I think there's a, um, a desire, especially right now to like jump in and make change right now. This is, I just got off a phone call with a group of student organizers. They're, they're, they're ready to, you know, to go and change the world. And my message to them is not to slow down, but to actually, um, to actually think through, um, uh, how are you going to, how are you going to build this movement within yourself? So. That's Thank amazing. You, Scott. Yeah, Kimi yeah, Ajahn, go, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with Scott and ask, um, what skills did you learn practicing law uh, that you use in your current role? And if you could go back, uh, what skills would you spend more or less time honing in on? Yeah, um, and, and maybe some context and background. When I went to law school, I, there, was, there are no lawyers in my family. Um, um, I remember being, I went to, um, dinner at, it was a friend of the family who was a litigator. And he said, so do you want to, you want to be a litigator or you want to do transactional law? And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> Is that something you need to decide right now? <laughs> this is, I think my third year or third week of law school. Um, and I remember feeling very much on the outside, um, of the profession. Um, and it was only later on that I felt like I had some confidence to be able to answer that question. Um, I think it's so funny, the classes that I took because I thought they were fun are in some cases the classes that I use the very most. Um, I talk about free speech uh, a lot. I talk about campus free speech a lot <laughs> and what, what the contours of, of speech and expression look like. Um, and so that First Amendment class that I took with Professor Brownstein was, <laughs> was <laughs> has come in handy. So, I mean, I've looked at my outline um, for that course um, as I'm trying to answer questions. Um, and I think more generally, some of the skills classes um, that I took, so things like um, civil procedure, frankly, I, you know, outside, I thought I would never use it after I stopped litigating. But the reality is what I think it, that class gave me was a strategic mindset um, of thinking through, okay, what is the process that I need to engage in to get a result for my client that is positive? Um, and in my current work, I think, I think very much about the problems we face sometimes as, as sort of legal problems, like how am I going to navigate this very difficult issue in order to emerge on the other side with a positive outcome for my client? Um, and so I find the skills to be very transferable. And I encourage folks to, to think in those, in those ways so that even if you're in a class that doesn't make, it doesn't you know, seem like it's going to help you in the future, it probably will. Um, so I guess it's worth paying attention <laughs> um, and, and you'll find it applies in interesting ways. That's great. I'd like to uh, ask Janet, you once said you think of your career um, as a jungle gym and not a ladder. Can you expand on that, please? Sure. I think traditionally, especially law students felt like they're summer associates, then their first year associates, da 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 da. At the top of the ladder is partnership, and you just kind of go up the rungs, and you know, you either reach the top or you do something else. And I think that's an outdated model, really, because first of all, I don't think I'm shocking anybody to say that 
partnership number one is not the be all and end all for everyone. So a lot of people aren't even aspiring to that. And also partnership is hard to attain, at, especially at a, at a law firm like mine. Uh, so I think if you think more about this straight line thing, instead of a ladder, you think more of a jungle gym or a web where you're starting here and you're acquiring skills like we talked about, um, experiences, and that your interests might go this way or that way. And you're kind of, sometimes you're going sideways, maybe sometimes you're going down, but you know, you work your way up and you're accumulating things out along the way that can help you to achieve what you want. And I often say that in the olden days, you, you had this goal that was way at the top. You knew it was partnership. Nowadays, I think you're building a career over a long term and there might not even be things that exist now that you're going to get to eventually. So Scott's nodding his head. I mean, Nikki and me and Scott, we are all the same, right? Like we started off being attorneys and we're in these roles that my job didn't even exist when I started law school. There was no th such thing as director of attorney development, right? But I have to say, I, this, I didn't tell you this part. I started a swim school when I was 10 years old and I learned over time from having employees and doing performance reviews and doing training for my teachers. I learned that at the swim school, crazily enough, and all of those skills that I learned, I apply to the job that I have now. So I think if you think of your career as just creating these experiences for yourself and connecting how your experiences and your skills can be applied to something new and being open to opportunities, you'll make your way up that jungle gym. That's amazing. Thank you, Janet. I had this epiphany like last week that in the olden times, knowledge was much harder to come by. So there was much more value on knowledge, but now everything is at our fingertips. I mean, we have our phone with all the knowledge. So it's really that the focus must have shifted to skills and judgment and leadership and these sorts of things as opposed to knowledge. Um, I'll pivot with that to Nikki. Uh, we have one question which really, really spoke to my heart, so I had to jump in because I have the same problem. So this person asked, they're, they're a solo practitioner, they're a perfectionist, they like to have things done the right way. And so it's really hard to delegate. It's really hard to, um, and I, I totally feel that. Like it's hard for me sometimes to work as part of a team and be led, for example, because I have such strong conviction that my way is the right way. So you're a business owner, you must, you know, you, um, and you, you mentioned listening to others and being led. So how do you resolve that or how do you get comfortable with that? It's a great question. It's a work in progress, right? As an, it's a type A perfectionist who, if I got a 98, my dad was like, what happened? What did you get wrong, right? So it's, it, I think we are the way we are for a number of reasons, right? So it's something that I work on every day, but some of the things that have helped me is I realized I don't need to do everything perfectly or even excellent to be an excellent manager, excellent lawyer, excellent. It's a, it's a holistic thing. And um, so what I do is I ask myself every task that, that comes on my desk and I know, well, maybe wrongly, I think I do, I will do better than everybody else on my team, but that's how I feel. I ask myself, does this matter? And depending on what it is, does it really matter to um, my firm partners? You know, does it matter? Is this going to matter to my business 10 years from now? Is it, it, does it truly matter? And I check myself constantly against that. I also use, I started using all kinds of tools like um, uh, another IAB member, Bahram Sayyadinur told me about Asana. So I started using Asana. I started using Excel. And I started looking at these things to see how many moving parts of the project I have. And if I am going to be stuck doing that, what does it mean? What will I sacrifice, right? And I finally, um, because I want to be involved with everything. I like everything. I like to even upload the contacts to constant contacts, right? And I ask myself, doing this A plus and micromanaging this, 
what is the cost of this behavior? And when I see the cost might be having the time to reach out to Clorox or MoFo and talk about the future partnership and then having impact on the many people. Um, and I think if you're a solo practitioner, whether you're doing family or immigration or employment, it's the same thing. Maybe if you do something yourself, instead of delegating to a student or a paralegal, it will be done better. But what is the cost of it? Is this the cost of being able to go out and speak at a panel and being able to impact someone or taking on another client? So I try to constantly, it's a daily struggle, but through a lot of methods, I try to kind of keep myself accountable. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have a question for Scott. So, you know, you switched from being a lawyer and now you work for university. Can you kind of tell us how you learned to grow in areas that you weren't naturally good at or wasn't like you never thought that this type of skill set is naturally um, part of the lawyer job description, but it's part of being, you know, an educator, being um, a university professional? That is a really good question. Um, thank you for it. I, it reminds me a lot of um, at least something that you said that I think you got from Janet, which was um, to be a good listener. Um, I think, um, and I, the way I approach listening is, I, I think of it as active listening. It's like, I, I need to be focused and engaged on you as the, as the person who's in front of me so that you know that I am hearing what you're saying and that I'm going to take that in uh metabolize it and then be able to uh, be able to incorporate it into my own practice and that is what i spent a lot of time doing um when i made the transition from um from practice into a higher ed setting um i was kind of lucky i made this i made this slide from working at a firm to working at a law school and then working at <laughs> and then working at um uh you know a university and university administration and so I think I had kind of um, a gentler learning curve. Um, but one thing that I found is that even as I continued to do my work, and I've been at Oregon State for about five years now, um, I learn every day and I need to be open to that learning. Um, I think it's a mistake when we think of ourselves as experts um, who don't have, where we don't have something, you know, some area to grow in. And so I'm constantly finding myself realizing Oh, I had no idea that that was a, you know, that that was something that I needed to to think about. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes from a sense of of um, it needs to it needs to be rooted in in that value, which is perhaps humility um, to uh, to learn um, and be open to learning. Thank you, Scott. And I'll ask Janet our final question. Uh, Ali mentioned that he never thought of himself as a natural born leader. Uh, for people who may feel the same way, what would you suggest as a first step to practice leadership and developing those skills if you've never mm. taken on that role before? Mm, that's a really good question. Well, if you've never thought of yourself as a leader, I think hearkening back to something Nikki said is I think of leadership kind of in three three buckets. One is leading yourself. That's kind of first. And that ties into both what Nikki and Scott said, like do some introspection, understand what your values are, understand what your gifts are, strengths are, places where you need to grow. And then kind of work on yourself, work on your time management, work on your interpersonal skills. So that's probably where I would start. The second level of leadership is managing other people and skills around that are coaching, for example. So I'm a certified coach. I think Nikki is as well, um, because that's one-on-one -on -one interpersonal skills or, or leading groups. And then kind of this higher level of leadership is leading an organization. And, and that's probably a high bar because it's about strategy and it's about influencing when you don't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So I think, I think I would start with yourself, kind of do that inventory that that's important in order to then cascade to leading others. Thank you, Janet. Uh, before I turn it to Saud for um, our next musical performance, um, 
uh, I, I wanted to share. Uh, well, first of all, there's going to be there's the Q and A button at the bottom. So while Saud is playing our next song, please please go ahead and submit any any and all questions um, to our amazing panelists. They all switch jobs from big law to something else. Um, they all uh, I'm Jan I know Janet and Nikki are uh, current and ex business owners. Um, so there's a lot of good good things to ask. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up with my thought after Saud plays, but Saud, if you don't mind, um, that was, the first one was beautiful. I can't wait for the second one. And then we'll regroup after the break. You guys. Beautiful. We have your fans there too, Saud. Right on, man. I hope I woke y'all up. <laughs> uh, Saud, so since we have you and you have an incredible story yourself, uh, we would love to hear your story and kind of how, um, yeah, how, how do you look at growth? Um, how did you grow into your musical career? Because I know you have another career as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Well, um, as you know, 
I, of course, you know, I come from the same background as you, so I had the parents, especially the father, who expected me to be a certain thing growing up. I was either going to be, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or etc. cetera, um, and he was, he's a real estate tycoon. So, um, but pretty early on, I decided I wanted to do something way different. So all of a sudden, in my teens, I had hair down to my butt. I had big, long, big hoop earrings. I had torn clothes. I had eyeliner, which for a very devout Muslim father... <laughs> was not awesome, but I'll tell you something about it. One cool thing is my father, as much as it drove him nuts, he was totally supportive, and that had a lot to do with my growth. Even though he hated it, he, would, he totally gave me money for my first demo. He gave me money to help me out, for instance, with my first, uh, my first studio, etc. So I actually did have that support, and over time, like I said, my father was always still like, oh, you have to have something else. And I was able to do this, you know, I've been doing this for 32 years now, you know, playing music for a living. And that you mentioned I have another career. I actually did start doing real estate as a hobby, and it ended up becoming a part of me. I actually ended up for a while, I was the Bay Area sales manager for Coldwell Banker for three years. So all of a sudden, I went from being on stage to sitting in an office 11 flights up, looking at the Bay Area. And after doing that for about two and a half years, I realized, what am I doing here? <laughs> I realized that, you know, I'd achieved something that maybe someone else wanted. And so I decided, okay, I, I went, ended up going back to being an agent, but then, of course, going back to doing this full time. And, and honestly, this is, this is a new kind of growth here, what we're doing, because I'd gotten so used to being on stage for the past 30, 32 years, and now I'm having to learn how to do this the way we're doing it right now. Luckily, I have my friend Mark Milborn here helping me out in the studio. But, yeah, this is a new kind of growth. Hey, Mark. So this, this is growth right here, right? What's happening right now, this is the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> so today it's growing for me. Thank you, Scott. Um, I have another question for Nikki. Earlier you mentioned to be a good leader, you also need to learn to follow sometimes, which I thought was really interesting. Could you expand upon when or how to know when to listen versus when to take charge in a situation? Um, absolutely. So it's like dancing, right? You know, you have to know how to lead and, you know, pivot and go backwards and go forwards. So for me, the way it works is part of that leadership has a little bit of control to it, right? I'm controlling the project. I am, you know, uh, controlling the deadlines. So what I try to do, the way I have tried to know when I need to follow, and this is kind of related to the question that was asked before of how do you delegate? Or what I said before where I had to learn to let other people lead and watch. This was inspired by someone I worked, worked with at Wilmer Hale at the, my previous firm. And he told me that as much as he likes to micromanage, he will let me do that deposition. He will let me go to court, but, I'm, but he's gonna stand by the side of the pool with the life jacket and he will throw it in. So there is no fear. So what I do is in some time to taking that back row and saying, okay, like in a kind of like what you're doing today, you're going to ask the questions. You are going to le like lead this, um, uh, meeting. You're going to set the agenda. You're going to reach out to my, like my students who work for me. You're going to actually finalize the trademark and go for it. But I'm standing right here and I'm watching. So I am still like in it, leading it by example and by that support. But I'm no longer doing the. I'm not. No, I'm no longer controlling the tasks. I don't know if that helps answer your question. So it's just more of the flexibility like you know in, a, in order to be strong sometimes you know how to you need to know how to bend so it's the same thing where to lead that just sometimes means it's not leadership through um setting the deadlines and controlling and making speeches and like you know making sure everything runs by just giving the, the basic framework and explaining that i am there to support i am watching but like you know and if they mess up it's going to be okay because a lot of times we learn through failure and through those things as well. And that's just 
part of the process of learning to become a leader. Great, thank you for that. Um, I would like to ask Janet a question. So um, kind of circling back to something Ali said, where you know knowledge is readily available. I mean, Google is so easy to use, but skills are more in demand. Where do where do I go look for skills? I mean, is are skills something that I just learn in law school and that's it? Or how should I go about finding the skills and using them and perfecting them? Definitely not just law school, that is for sure. Uh, I think sometimes we underestimate the failure uh, aspect that Nikki said. I think we, if we adopt a growth mindset, I don't know if your listeners have, but all of you have heard of that idea, but the idea is you don't come at something with this idea that, that you have a, just a static ability to do something or not do something. You have the idea that you're gonna try new things and there'll be failures and you learn from those and that means you just try more and more. Um, so that is definitely the way that I think we should all think about it is giving ourselves that growth mindset. Also make this analogy of how would you take a young woman or like say elementary school student who's just learning how to play tennis and make her into Serena Williams, like the best tennis player there is. How do you know, or and how would she get there? Well, so she needs some innate ability, right? She needs some hand-eye coordination. If she completely has no hand-eye coordination, maybe the talent could, could just not be there, but some level of that, right? She needs to know the rules. That's the knowledge thing. She, she under, needs to understand how the game is played but she needs coaching and she needs practice, 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 lots of competitions, failures and things like that. And that's the skill that you build over time. And I think that's how you become a good lawyer too. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Scott, uh, there's a lot going on with students, international students. Uh, I mean, as if COVID wasn't enough pressure um, everything wasn't enough pressure. Now um, our, you know, our dear, dear international students that are under attack. Is they're just, it's horrible. So uh, you must have been super busy. You must have been emotionally invested in a lot of cases. Um, and at the same time, you're a leader. People look up to you and need you to be strong in these moments. So how do you, um, when you run out of energy, what do you do? And how do you not run out of energy? And how do you navigate that? Ah, uh, that's a <laughs> the hard one. Um, well, I go to the fridge and I get a Diet Coke and I, I'm just kidding. Um, I think <laughs> um, that's a really good one. I actually wanted to take uh, another part of that, which you didn't ask the question, but is, is just around um, managing yourself emotionally um, <laughs> as a leader. <laughs> and um, a lot of what I and um, I think so this is responsive to your question about like about energy is like I can't if I am out of energy and I need someone to step in and I don't have relationships to lean on um, then I'm going to have a lot harder time <laughs> making it through a particular um, through a particular challenge and so I tend to think about my work as being and, and in my work to be honest I don't have a lot of hard power right I'm not telling the provost or the president what to do. Um, and in many cases, I'm not telling, you know, deans of colleges what to do. I need to rely on their, on our relationships and their trust in my, in my good judgment um, in, order to, in order to move projects forward. And so I think um, knowing that you have good people around you so that you can step out to take care of yourself um, is really important. Um, and I also think of those relationships as being really important so that when you find yourself challenged in a moment and you need a thought partner, um, that that person is available for you to pick up the phone or get on teams or whatever it is now to say, Hey, I need you to, I need to check in with you about this. Um, and interestingly, um, the friends that, 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 uh, that I made that sat on the both sides of my office when I was a first year associate are 
some of those same thought partners for me now, <laughs> where they work at totally different, you know, in totally different fields. Um, but I know that we have this, we've invested time in that, re in that relationship. And so I think it's worth doing that. Um, and I think the other part is like leadership doesn't, shouldn't come at the cost of those relationships. Um, we lift each other up. Um, we are able to um, hold each other accountable. Um, and ultimately it's a, like, I think of leadership as being a collaborative enterprise and not just something that, that you do on your own. So yeah, response to that. Thank you, Scott. Um, we have a few questions about, uh, this is relevant to everyone. How do you maintain your spirit of leadership when you find yourself running out of energy? And I think that's particularly relevant to the times we're living in. So if you all could just give your response to that question. I'm happy to start. Um, as an entrepreneur, just like a big law associate, there's never enough time. And now you add to it the new challenges, having to figure things out. And everybody's emotions are running high. So it doesn't matter who you're working with, whether I'm working with a student or a law firm partner, we're all going through this together. So one thing that I do that substantial, I do two things that substantially help me. One is when I get overwhelmed, I take a break. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter if I have four presentations in one week. It doesn't matter. When I hit that point, you have to take a break. I've learned this the hard way through many years because even if I just take that mental break of 24 hours and just sit there, go for a walk, watch Netflix, you'll be amazed. You'll come back to it and suddenly your body has rested, your mind has rested, and now I'm infused with creativity. And two is exercise. That even if it was an option before this, now I need it. I need it to, because it shows growth, right? It's one thing that I have control over. So by seeing my growth, that I can run faster, I can be, however way you want to measure that progress, so that the things that I have control over by, you know, by kind of going back to the basics, I did the same thing when I was studying for the bar. It kind of gives me that, the framework I need to then lead and deal with the uncertainties. I can add, I, I totally agree with Nikki on the exercise. Like to me, that is a priority. So you have to decide kind of what your must haves are. And mine is like, I have to get outside every day and I have to walk every day. And if I don't do that, I'm kind of useless. So I might as well just get it done. And then the other thing I think that sustains me is I'm very outward focused and helping other people like Ali knows. And so when I get down, I, I think like, what did I do today to make somebody else's life better? And that sustains me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, on that note, uh, I have five amazing takeaways um, that, that I was writing down as everyone was talking today during this rich conversation. I'll start with the last one, which is what Janet just mentioned. Um, I went to another webinar yesterday and they made a distinction between numbing, uh, numbing relaxation and energy making relaxation. So the example was if you Netflix and chill after it's done, if you're already stressed about a work thing after you're done with your movie or show, the stress comes back. But if you go to the gym or cook or do meditation or something that's just restorative, uh, it's, it's different. And we all, we all need both, but that was a nice distinction. That was number one. Number two, skills, skills, skills. Uh, and I think about this, um, by focusing on what you don't like about a situation, you take away the chance to learn the skills. So this was Scott's point about his CIFPRO class. Like it, it, it had nothing to do with CIFPRO. It could have been contracts, it could be some other class. He focused on strategy, on, on how, how to use the skills he gained from that class and those were relevant to him later. Three, listening. It's something we all can do. Uh, it takes a little bit of concentration and exercise, but I learned that from Janet. So everyone around me is happy for, uh, for you teaching that to me, Janet, and, and a lot of us actually attended that seminar. Number four, uh, leadership is doing. So you don't learn it by uh, not doing. 
things. Uh, one of the best advice I got as a first year associate uh, was uh, I kept complaining about there aren't enough associates and they, are, they aren't hiring enough people and there is too much work. And my mentor told me, Who, who's they? Like, this is your organization. You want more associates? Go get your friends to come work here. Like, this is your company. So don't sit back and say, they, they this, they that. It's your organization. Take ownership. Go do it. And then that takes me to the last point, which is a, a point everyone made. Janet summarized it perfectly. Uh, of thinking of leadership as layers. So there's leading yourself, the most inner layer, there's leading others, and then there's leading an organization. And each layer comes with its own set of skills. Um, so that way you constantly keep growing in your leadership. Um, I, we have a couple more things that Kimia and Yalda will announce, but I just wanted to thank everyone, everyone for attending, all of our amazing guests. Nikki John for being a founding IBA member and continuing to give back. Um, Yala John, I'll hand it over for your announcement. Great, thank you. So this is a friendly reminder um, to apply for the Iranian American Bar Association's uh, scholarships, including the inaugural Judge Irvani, Sta Irvani Sani uh, Public Interest Scholarship. So please feel free to see our website, which has all the details and the deadlines, which are uh, July 31st. Yalda, um, I also want to give a friendly reminder that next week, IABA NorCal will be hosting our first and virtual wellness week, where we will be diving into themes each day and posting videos on our social media platforms with from certified instructors covering topics from yoga, workouts, healthy recipes, and these will all culminate in a live webinar event uh, on Thursday, July 16th at 6.30 with a clinical psychologist and nutritionist, and we'll even have the Honorable Judge Irvati Sani from the Superior Court of Santa Clara do our opening remarks, so I hope you all can make it to that. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, before I turn it to you, Saud, I just wanted to acknowledge your amazing uh, speech as lessons to us all, to all of us with um, overachieving Middle Eastern parents. You taught us <laughs> that if we uh, keep doing it right, maybe, maybe they will come around and support us. Uh, and my parents have done too. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Saud will close us out with our final song. Uh, and then we'll wave goodbye to you all and see you hopefully next week for the wellness events and the week after for summer five. So thanks Ali. Thanks everybody. Someday when I'm off below when the world is cold I will feel a glow just thinking of you And the way you look tonight Yes, you're lovely With your smile so warm so soft there is nothing for me but to love you and the way you look tonight with each word your tenderness grows tearing my feet change keep that breathless charm won't you please arrange it cause I love you just the way you look Touch 
pierces my foolish heart. Lovely, don't you ever change. Keep that breathless charm. Won't you please arrange it? Cause I love you just the way you look tonight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just the way you look tonight Thanks everybody Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone.